Welcome to our morning service and let us commence our worship by singing to the Lord's praise from Psalm 103, that is on page 369. All our psalms this morning will be from the Scottish Psalter. Psalm 103 at verse 8, the Lord our God is merciful and he is gracious, long-suffering and slow to wrath, in mercy plenteous. He will not chide continually, nor keep his anger still. With us he dealt not as we sinned, nor did requite our ill. For as the heaven in its sight, the earth surmounteth far, so great to those that do him fear, his tender mercies are. As far as east is distant from the west, so far hath he from us removed in his love all our iniquity. Such pity as a father hath unto his children dear, like pity shows the Lord to such as worship him in fear. We shall sing these verses to the Lord's praise from Psalm 103, verse 8 to 13. The Lord our God is merciful, and he is gracious. The Lord our God is merciful and he children and young people with us. I would just like to give a short address uh, to them by simply summarizing our morning sermon. Our theme for the day, both this morning and evening, will be on the Lamb of God. Now I wonder if any of the younger people know who was the last prophet of the Old Testament. Well, his, his name was John, and he became known as John the Baptist. Now, if we had met with John in those days, I'm not sure what we would have made of him, because he didn't live in a village or a town or a city. Instead, he lived in 
the wilderness. He wasn't wearing designer clothes, and he ate locust and wild honey. So probably we would have thought of John as being a very odd fellow. But John was a preacher, and he always preached uh, near a river, especially the river Jordan, because as people believed, he would baptize them. That's why he became known as John the Baptist. His message was very simple, repent and believe. Repent means turning into the opposite direction, to turn away from the direction you were going into, uh, into another uh, direction. To believe. What were they to believe? They were to believe the word of God. Now here we have the Old Testament church. And John is telling them to repent, to change the direction, and to believe the word of God. What did the word of God tell them? Well, the word of God promised them a deliverer, that a deliverer was going to come. To deliver them from what? To deliver them from the consequences of their sin because the wages of sin is death. Now remember, we are dealing with the Old Testament church. And the Old Testament church mode of worship was to take a lamb and to sacrifice a lamb. A lamb would be about a year old. They were to confess their sins, and then the lamb was to be killed. The lamb became a substitute for them. I'll digress a wee bit. There was a man in the Old Testament known as Abraham, and he had a son, Isaac. And one day Abraham and Isaac went to Mount Moriah. And as Isaac, his son, looked around, he said to his father, Father, we have the rope to bind the sacrifice, we have the fire we have the knife, and we have the wood. But where is the lamb for a sacrifice? And Abraham, his father, turned to him and he said, God will provide for himself a lamb. Now let us move fast forward. Let us go down through the centuries. And let us come back to this man called John the Baptist, who's preaching by the river of Jordan, and who is telling the people to repent and to believe the word of God, to believe in the promise of a deliverer. And he sees this man coming towards him. And he lifts his hand and he points to him and he says, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Well, when John said that about the man who was coming towards him, and the man was Jesus, the people of that day understood what he meant. That he meant this is the true Lamb of God. This is the Lamb that can truly take away sin. Although many lambs had been killed and much blood had been spilt right down through the ages of the Old Testament, and although the people confessed their sin, Oh, as the lamb was killed and the lamb became their substitute. Nevertheless, these lambs were never able really to deal with sin. The only one who could deal with sin was the deliverer that was promised. And here is John, and he's pointing to Jesus, and he's saying, here is the deliverer. Here is the one who can truly deal with sin. Here is the one who can forgive our sins. Here is the blood that will truly wash our sins away. Here is the one who is truly the Lamb of God. And the Old Testament prophet Isaiah says about Jesus that he is led as a lamb to the slaughter. Speaking there of the cross, the cross of Golgotha. And after Jesus died on the cross, 
and he rose again as the Lamb of God. Therefore, no more lamb sacrifices were needed because the true Lamb of God had been sacrificed who can deal with our sin, who can truly deliver us from the wages of sin. The true lamb that could deal with sin had been sacrificed. But the message today that we have here in this church is the same message that John had by the River Jordan. Repent and believe. Change your direction. Change around and believe. And believe the word of God. And the message can be summarized to us in the words of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, the true Lamb of God, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, and that means me and you, whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, that's our theme today, the Lamb of of God. Let us now join together in prayer to the Lord. We shall repeat the Lord's prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now sing again to the Lord's praise from Psalm 25. And that's the first version of the psalm. Psalm 25, first version at verse 4. Show me thy ways, O Lord, Thy path so teach thou me, and do thou lead me in thy truth, therein my teacher be. For thou art God that does to me salvation send, and I upon thee all the day expecting to attend. Thy tender mercies, Lord, I pray thee to remember, and loving kindnesses for thee have been of all forever. My sins and faults of youth do thou, O Lord, forget. After thy mercy think on me, and for thy goodness great. We shall sing these verses to the Lord's praise, Psalm 25, first version, verse 4 to 7. Show me thy ways, O Lord, thy paths, O teach thou me. Show me thy ways, O Lord, thy paths, O teach thou me. Oh, 
from the Word of God, from the New Testament, and the Gospel according to John and chapter 1. The Gospel according to John and chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they that had been sent from the Pharisees, they asked him, Then why are you baptizing? (coughs) You are neither the Christ nor Elijah, nor the prophet. Jesus answered them, I baptize with water. But among you stands one you do not know, even even he who comes after me. The strap of his sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he of who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. The next day again John was standing with two of his disciples, And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. 
One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said of him, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before a Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. <coughs> Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. May the Lord bless to us the reading of that portion of his word. Let us unite together again in prayer. Eternal and ever-blessed Lord, we give thanks to you this morning for the great privilege that you have given to us when we are able to assemble in one place under thine own word with a desire in our hearts to come and to worship thee and to acknowledge thee as our God and to give thanks for the revelation that thou hast made of thyself through thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have confidence and boldness to come into the very throne room of God this day and to lay out our petitions before thee, knowing that in and through him that thou art able to meet with the needs of each and every one of us. We give thanks that we can come to a throne of grace to seek thy mercy and to seek for thy grace to help us in our time of need as we come before thee anew this morning to confess our sin, to acknowledge that we do sin daily in, th in word, in thought and in deed. But blessed be thy name for the provision that thou hast made for us in thy Son, and for the efficacy of his finished work, and for the great promise that thou hast given to thy people, that if we confess our sins, that thou art faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that in and through thy Son that we can be reconciled to our God, that that communion and fellowship that was broken by sin can be restored uh, to us. We give thee thanks, O Lord, for the work of thy grace in the hearts of sinners such as we are. We give thee thanks, O Lord, that thou art the one that regenerates thy people, that thou art the one who calls them, that thou art the one who justifies them, and who adopts them into thine own family, giving them the spirit of adoption, whereby we can come and cry unto thee, Abba, Father. And we give thanks, O Lord, for the work of sanctification that begins in the hearts of sinners, and that will ultimately be completed on the day of our glorification. We give thee thanks, O Lord, that all these benefits and blessings have been sealed for us through the blood of the everlasting covenant. We give thanks to thee, O Lord, 
for all the tokens of thy goodness and kindness that you so abundantly out, outpour upon us every day in things that are temporal as well as in things that are spiritual. We give thee thanks today for thy word. And as we come to meditate on thy word, we seek the help of thine own spirit, for we are dependent upon thy spirit to open our hearts, to open our ears, to open our understanding in regards to thine own word, so that the word may be applied to us by thy spirit, be lodged in our heart and bring forth evidence in our lives to the glory of thy name, to the eternal good of our souls. We seek thy blessing upon the congregation here. We pray, Lord, that thou would bless every home and every family that belongs to them in their varied circumstances and situations. Thou art the all-knowing God. Thou knowest what each family and each individual stand in need of. And we pray that out of the riches of thy grace that thou would meet with them at their own particular point of need. We remember before thee this day those who are mourning within the community. O Lord, the voice of death is so often, often heard among us. And grant, O Lord, that with each voice that we would not be hardening our hearts, but that grant us that wisdom to number our own days, knowing that we also are passing through this world and that each one of us is going to his long home. We pray, Lord, that I would be with the families that mourn the passing of their loved ones. And we give thee thanks, O Lord, for thy servants, those who, who were so faithful in the cause of Christ in this uh, community, those who serve thee uh, so well uh, and so sincere for many years. Now their labors have ceased. Now they have uh, been received by thee to be in a closer communion and fellowship with thyself. That is the reason why thou hast redeemed thy people, not to leave them in this world, but to bring them where thou art. Is that not thine own desire in the presence of thy Father? Father, I will that those whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, and that they may behold my glory. O Lord, we give thee thanks for thy great promises of the gospel. And we pray, Lord, that their passing would indeed be a means of bringing us to remembrance of our own passing, that the time is coming when we also must pass through uh, this uh, way. We pray, Lord, that thou would bless those who are ill, uh, those who are in hospital or at home who are being cared for. We pray thy blessing upon them and that thou would also meet with them at their point of need. We ask thy blessing upon the pastor of the congregation, the one whom thou hast sent and called uh, to oversee thy cause in this corner of thy vineyard, that thou would bless him in his ministry and in his family. And we give thanks unto thee this day for young Finley, that he is back home with his family. And we pray, Lord, that thou would continue to strengthen him in the days that lie ahead. We pray, Lord, that thou would bless the office bearers of the congregation and all the duties that are upon them, that thou would bless thy people here. Grant to us, O Lord, that we may be faithful witnesses for thee in this world, that we may be as lights that would shine in the darkness of this world. We pray, Lord, for all thy servants who have gone forth with thy word today. May thou, O Lord, grant to them utterance and boldness in, uttering, in uh, proclaiming thy own truth uh, this day. We pray, Lord, that thou remember our nation. We acknowledge that we have gone far away from thee. We pray, O Lord, that thou would bring us to days of repentance, days when we would sorrow over our sin and seek the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. We pray, O Lord, that thou would watch over us now for the moments that we are together. And all that we ask with the forgiveness of our sin, it's in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. 
We shall sing further to the Lord's praise from Psalm 84. Psalm 84. How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord of hosts to me. The tabernacles of thy grace, how pleasant, Lord, they be. My thirst is so long vehemently gave haste thy courts to see. My very heart and flesh cry out, O living God, for thee. Behold, the sparrow findeth out an house for him to rest. The swallow also for herself hath purchased a nest. In thine own altar, where she safe, her young ones forth may bring. O thou almighty Lord of hosts, who art my God and King. We shall sing these verses to the Lord's praise, Psalm 84, verse 1, to the end of the double verse mark 3. How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord of hosts, to me. How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord of hosts, to me, the tabernacles of thy grace. Let us turn back to the portion of Scripture that we read together in the New Testament in the Gospel according to John and chapter 1. And this morning we shall look at words found in verse 29. The next day saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, these are words that may be very familiar uh, to us, and I'm sure that many of us have heard sermons from these very words. And that, at times, can leave us uh, reluctant to repeat sermons upon them. But here is John, and he is proclaiming Jesus as the Lamb of God. And then the very next day, what was his text? We read in verse 35, Behold the Lamb of God. He was not afraid of repeating the same words. And I think that reason may be that he realized, as we all have to do, that the Lamb of God is central to everything. He is the foundation upon which 
we must build our faith. He is the heart of the gospel that we preach. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and says, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. For the Jews demand signs and the Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. He wrote to the church at Galatia and he said, Be far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and die to the world. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ was everything to Paul. The Lamb of God was everything to Paul and it ought to be everything for every Christian. And we cannot think of the cross without thinking of the one who died on the cross and therefore to think of him as the Lamb of God. But first of all, who was this John? Who was this John that made this great proclamation regarding Jesus? Well, he was not the writer of this gospel, but he was John the Baptist. He was sent by God as a prophet. And as we have already intimated this morning, he was the last of the Old Testament prophets. He was sent as the herald of Christ. He was sent to prepare the people of Israel for the coming of Jesus Christ, their Messiah. And in announcing the coming of Christ, John the Baptist called the people to repentance and to faith. And he insisted that this was to be seen and made manifest in a reformation of life, that their lives were to be transformed. When Jesus finally appeared, John announced him in the words of our text, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We may consider it strange that Jesus is likened to and to and identified with an animal. But here and in other places throughout Scripture, he is likened to a lamb. But he's also likened to a lion. He is said to be the lion of the tribe of Judah. And as we shall see that Jesus being identified as a lamb brings before a certain characteristics that belongs to his person, and especially his sacrificial work, the work of the cross, And just as his being identified as a liar of the tribe of Judah brings before us his sovereignty and his kingship and uh, informs us that he came from the tribe of Judah. Well, there are three great truths contained in our text. It tells us of the identity of Christ. Who is Christ? He is the Lamb of God. It tells us of the work of Christ. He is to take away the sin of the world. And it also tells us of our privilege and our responsibility that we are to behold him. We look at the text this morning under these three headings. The identity of Christ. He is the Lamb of God. The work of Christ, he is to take away the sin of the world. And our privilege and responsibility is to behold him. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time going over what this phrase, Lamb of God, would mean to the Jewish mind and to Jewish society in which these words were first spoken. Lambs played such an important role, not only in the economy, but also in the religious life to which the Old Testament bears witness, which is filled with reference uh, to lambs. The main annual feast called 
the Passover bore witness uh, to the importance of the Lamb, as it was through the shedding and sprinkling of the blood of the Lamb that their fathers were set free from the last plague and from the bondage of Egypt, a feast that they were commanded constantly uh, to keep. But long before the Passover feast was instituted by God, actually from the Garden of Eden and after Adam sinned, man was taught the importance of sacrifice, which was instituted by God himself. When God clothed Adam and his wife with skins, which we believe came from a sacrifice, and this before man was expelled from the garden, it was a lesson that which Adam passed on to his sons, to his family. In the very garden, our first parents were taught that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or no forgiveness of sin. Sacrificial worship was not something that uh, Adam invented. It was not something that man invented. It was something that was instituted by God himself. It was not of man's invention or of man's thinking. It was God that instituted sacrificial worship. And here we find that John is declaring that the person who was standing before the people was God's provision, appointed by him in the covenant of redemption to redeem a people, and that he came into the world on purpose that he might save his people from their sins or from the consequences of their sin. That he was a fulfillment of all the sacrifices of the Old Testament. What was before them in the person of Jesus was the very heart of the gospel message. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God required a sacrifice. And God provides the sacrifice. Not from outside himself, but from within. The Son of God, the second person of the Godhead, becomes the Lamb of God. The Son becomes God manifest in the flesh. Among the Jews, uh, the lamb was the ma their main sacrifice. Twice a day, they sacrificed a lamb as a burnt offering, as a morning and evening sacrifice. Lambs were constantly used as a sacrifice. A man would pick out from his flock a lamb that was without spot or blemish. It had to be a perfect lamb. And he would bring it to the priest in order for it to be uh, offered upon the altar that was in the outer court to make atonement for him. For the person to receive the benefits of the atonement, that person would have placed his hands on the head of the lamb. And this action of the offerer gives us a view of faith. For a lamb as a sacrifice to have any meaning for an Israelite, he had to have faith. The offerer puts his hand on the head of the lamb. In the Hebrew, it means that he leaned his hand. It was not just a touch. It was a leaning. In other words, the leaning of the hand expressed the identity of the offerer and the offering. In other words, the, the offerer became identified with the offering. The offering stood in the place of the offerer. The offering, say a lamb, 
became the substitute for the offerer. The writer to the Hebrew comments like this. He says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Why then all the sacrifices of the Old Testament? Why all this killing of lambs? Why was all this blood shed in the Old Testament if there were, it, was, uh, it was impossible for it to take away sin or to deal with sin? It was all a uh, picture for us. They all prefigured what was to become true regarding the Lamb of God, which is Jesus Christ. Maybe this is best illustrated to us in the case of one of Adam's sons called Abel. As we said, sacrificial worship was instituted by God. It was not of man's invention. Worship of God must always be in accordance to the word of God, not man's invention. We are not to take in to the worship of God our own inventions. We must worship God in the way that he has prescribed for us in his word. And a sacrificial worship was not something that the Old Testament church thought of and said, this is the way we're going to worship God. No. They worshiped God in the way that God taught them, and that was sacrificial worship, because it was a prefigurement of what was to become true in the fullness of time and in regards to the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And Adam would have taught his children of what God required. He would have taught them the, of the necessity of a blood sacrifice by which sinful man was to approach God. In Genesis chapter 4, we read, In the course of time came uh, Cain, that's the other son, another son of Adam, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. You see, Cain brought the works of his own hands. He probably labored extremely hard, and there was probably much that commended that offering to himself. But what was the problem with Cain's offering? There were, there were two things. Two things. First, it did not involve the shedding of blood. There was a great difference between the offering of Cain and his brother Abel. Abel brought a sacrifice that pointed forward to the deliverer, that pointed forward to the atoning death of the spotless substitute in the fullness of time in the person of Jesus Christ at Golgotha. And we'll say more about that in a moment. As I've already said, we cannot come to God in any way of our own devising. That is what Cain did. He decided for himself how he was going to approach God. Here is a picture for us of all those who come, pointing to their own works, pointing to their own merits, pointing to their own righteousness, those who reject and despise coming to God in the way which he has appointed through the sacrifice of his own beloved Son, Jesus Christ. So the first thing was, it did not involve the shedding of blood. The second difference, and the key point, is that it was empty of faith. The writer to the Hebrews in chapter 11 says, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. John Calvin says, The sacrifice of Abel was more acceptable than that of his brother, only because it was sanctified 
by faith. Paul tells us that for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You see, Abel came in faith, while Cain came in unbelief. All the sacrifices of the Old Testament, as we have already noted, prefigured what was true or to become true of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Most of the sacrifices of the Old Testament had to be without blemish. They had to be perfect. A lamb had to be perfect, prefiguring what was true of the Lamb of God. He was sinless. Why then did he have to die? He died as a substitute of his people. In 1 Peter we read, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. The prophet Isaiah says, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The guilt and punishment of our sins were imputed or reckoned to Christ. He stood in our place and he bore in himself what our sins deserved. The just and sinless Lamb of God bore God's wrath and curse against, that was against our sins. He who knew no sin was made sin for us. That is, he became the sin bearer. He became the offering for our sin. There was no other way whereby our sins could be taken away or dealt with. There was no other way whereby we, our sins could be forgiven except by laying it on Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God manifest in the flesh. Well, do you know him today as your substitute? Was he at Golgotha at the place of the cross in your place? Did he suffer for you what your sins Deserved. He takes away sin. How? Again, First Peter we read, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. The prophet Isaiah says, And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, the guilt, the punishment of our sins being reckoned to Christ. Him standing in our place, bearing what our sins deserve, bearing the wages of sin. And the Bible makes it clear that the wages of sin is death. And he suffered death in all its aspects. He suffered death physically. He suffered uh, death spiritually. He suffered death eternally. He suffered death. He suffered what our sins deserve. The just and sinless Lamb of God bearing the consequences of our sins. He who knew no sin became the sin offering for us. He became the sin bearer for us. There's no other way whereby our sins could be taken away whereby we could receive forgiveness for our sin. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He came to take away sin. He did not come to take away poverty or pain or sickness or sorrow, but he came to take away something that lies beneath all of these things, namely sin. He came to take away the source of all these things, poverty, pain, sickness, sorrow, and so on. Sin is the central problem of mankind. Sin has caused all our misery. It is the cause of our poverty. It is the cause of our pain. It is the cause of our sorrow. It is the cause of death. The Catechism answers to the question, what is the misery of that estate wherein to man fell? And the Catechism answers, all mankind by their fall lost communion with God, are under his wrath and curse, and so made liable to all miseries in this life, to death itself, and to the pains of hell 
forever. Well, what is man to do? How can the consequences and punishment of our sins be taken away? And here John directs us. And he says to us, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 5, we read, You know that he appeared in order to take away his sins, and in him there is no sin. He could never have taken away the sins of others if he had sins of his own. He was sinless. And only God could provide a sinless man who had the purity to be the adequate substitute for sinners like me and you. And he did so by sending and delivering up his own son. Paul, writing to the church at Rome, says, he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. The Lamb of God, his own son, is God's provision for sinners like me and you. If we are going to be saved from what our sins deserve, his is the only provision. God's Son, the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God had a mission to accomplish. He was to take away the sin of the world. The world here means both Jews and Gentiles. Salvation was for Jew and Gentile. He came to save out of every kindred, out of every tribe, and out of every tongue, and out of every nation. He came to save people of every kind, the harlot, the publican, the beggar, the religious, the world. And if you are part of the world, and you are, you may have hope for the taking away of what your sins deserve if you come by repentance and faith. And behold the Lamb of God. Jesus is to be looked upon as our only hope of forgiveness, of our only hope of being reconciled to God, our only hope of having peace with God, our only hope of heaven, is through Jesus Christ and him crucified, is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God's only provision for salvation. There is salvation in no other except in Jesus Christ. Not only was our sins laid upon him, but he took them away. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Where did he take it? Well, Psalm 103, we sang earlier, as far as the east is from the west, so far he removed our transgressions from us. In Micah 7, we read, you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Jesus on Golgotha took the sin of all believers away so completely that, according to the prophet, they sank into the bottom of the sea. God has cast all the sins of believers behind his back. They shall not be mentioned against them any more forever. They shall never be brought up in order to condemn the believer. They have been cast into the depths of the sea, forgotten. In heaven, there is no more sea, so they cannot be brought up from the sea. He took away their guilt and punishment. Theology calls this by the word justification. In Isaiah 53, we read, By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. No longer can God condemn his people as sinners because he has condemned their sin and what their sins deserved in his own Son, and God manifest in the flesh. But he gives us what belonged to him his garment of righteousness. He gives us his righteousness while we give him our sin. 
That is what took place at Golgotha. On the cross of Golgotha, what did you give Jesus? You could only give him your sin. But what did he give you if you believe in him? If you trust in him, you gave him your sin and he gave you his righteousness. He gave us his righteousness while we gave him our sin. God took our sins, laid it upon him, and he did not refuse to take them. He took them voluntarily and he took them willingly, knowing full well what it meant for him. And as a result, God declares us righteous in his sight, as persons clothed with the righteousness of Christ. This is illustrated for us in the prophecy of Zechariah in chapter 3, where we read regarding Joshua the high priest. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, I see I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And there's no richer robe than the righteousness of Christ being reckoned to us, being imputed to us. There is no richer robe in this world than the righteousness of Christ, than being robed with the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness that was knit, the cloth, the garment that was knit by his own pierced hands. He has dealt completely with our sin. He cried out, it is finished. And when he ascended to the right hand of the Father, he sat down, which is a symbol of completeness. The high priest in Israel was not allowed to sit down. The prophets who lived a long time before the coming of Christ bore through witness to Christ as the Lamb of God according to the light they had. Jesus said to the Jews of his own day, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. How did he see him? How did the prophets see him? How did the Old Testament see him? How did Abel see him? In fact, how did John the Baptist see him? It is true to say that John the Baptist and others saw Jesus with their physical eyes, but there had to be something more for John to cry out, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There had to be more than just physical sight. John and all the prophets and all God's people throughout the Old Testament and this is also true of the New Testament believers. It's also true of me and you today. We must see Jesus by faith. By faith. As all the prophets and John saw Christ by faith, and as John now actually looked upon him and bore witness to him, so you and I must see him not with our physical eyes, the sight of him uh, with our eyes which is reserved until our resurrection. But we must see him with the eyes of our mind, our heart, in the exercise of faith. It is the sight of Jesus by faith which shall bring us to salvation, to truly see Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We must trust in him. What is faith? It is trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Mary is mother who gave him birth, who nursed him, who washed him, who fed him, had to receive the sight of her son for her salvation. Her physical beholding of him would not secure her salvation. She had to have this other sight of him, of trusting in the son to whom she gave birth for her salvation that he was truly the deliverer, that he was truly the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, you know about him, and you have heard of him, but have you truly seen him? Have you seen Jesus? 
Have you seen Jesus by faith? Have you seen Jesus by trusting in him? Those who have truly seen him can say with the psalmist, you are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. John directs his hearers to do something in reference to the Lamb of God, and he says that they are to behold him. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The word behold means more than just to glance at him. It means to focus upon him. To set our whole mind and heart and will upon him. To focus upon him with our entire mind, our entire thought, our entire heart, our entire will. To look upon him in faith, in belief, in trust. To become dependent upon him as the Lamb of God who can take away your sin, who can reconcile you to God, who can bring you to that place where you have peace with God, to take you to that place where you have that hope of heaven, to take you to that place where with great anticipation and expectation of heaven, to become dependent upon him as a lamb of God as the one who can truly deal with your sin. I cannot but think that his identification as a lamb has uh, reference to the fact that he took the nature of the flock. Very often in the Bible, God's people are spoken of as a flock, a flock of sheep. And I cannot but think that his identification as a lamb has reference to that, that he took our nature, that he came to, the the people he came to save, that he took their nature and that he did not discard it, but that he took it to the very throne room of God and now appears in heaven for us in that very nature that he took to himself. But we leave that, God willing, for the evening. We look upon him at the beginning of our Christian life as a Lamb of God. And today we still look upon him as the Lamb of God. For this we are exhorted to do always, to look into Jesus, and we shall still be looking upon him in heaven under the same character. We shall not have to change our thought of him, but we shall see him as the Lamb that has been slain. Here we see him in, by faith. In heaven, we shall behold him by sight. Well, this morning, I exhort you to look to him and see in Jesus the perfect provision by the grace of God to take away your sin, to reconcile you to God. I exhort you to cast yourself entirely upon him, to believe in him, to trust in him, to rest upon him and receive him today as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. I exhort you to follow him, to abide with him, and I exhort you to witness for him, to behold him today by faith as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, to trust in him as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And if you trust in him today as the Lamb of God, then with anticipation, and great expectation that the day shall dawn in your experience when you will also see him as the Lamb of God, as the Lamb of God. He will be forever for his people in that character of the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lord Bless our thoughts. Let us pray. Eternal and ever-blessed Lord, 
We give thanks today for the revelation that has been given to us of thee as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Grant to us, O Lord, that by faith that we may behold you and that we may know the benefit and the, uh, the blessings that you have purchased for thy people as being, for being the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We ask, O Lord, that thou would go before us in all things that we endeavour to do in thy name and bless thy word to us and forgive us for our sins. In Christ's name, amen. We shall conclude at this time by singing to the Lord's praise from Psalm 118 and at verse 24. This is a day God made in it will joy triumphantly, save now I pray thee, Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he in God's great name that cometh us to save. We from the house which to the Lord pertains, you blessed have. That is Psalm 118, we shall sing from verse 24 to the end of the psalm to the Lord's praise. This is a day God made in it, will joy triumphantly. <coughs> This is the day God made in it, will joy triumphantly. Save now, I pray thee, Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>